Hi everybody, welcome to our uh, first lesson in our post-war America unit, uh, Changes and Challenges in Post-War America. All right, one, here's our objectives and standards, to identify problems Americans face following the war and to analyze the factors that created a booming economy. And we have our standards as well, so please take a look at them. Our desired result, what changes and challenges did the United States face after World War II? Okay, so in 1946, after the war, 10 million uh, men and women were released and returned home uh, from war. Uh, remember, we discussed this back during World War II, that veterans had uh, been receiving educational benefits and loans for homes and farms um, from the GI Bill of Rights, which was passed in 1944, before the end of the war. Um, with that said, there was a housing crisis in 1945 and 1946, so following the war and at the end of the war. Uh, and many veterans were living in tiny apartments or they were forced to uh, live with family members. Uh, to help alleviate this, uh, we had two developers came up with a plan. Uh, their names were Henry Kaiser and William Levitt. Uh, they were both developers and they uh, kind of came up with an idea to respond to the housing crisis. Now, Kaiser uh, mass produced houses using assembly line production techniques, which made housing, uh, houses cheaper to own and buy. And Levitt uh, sold houses at a cheaper price in small communities outside the cities. Uh, one of the first ones was Levittown. Um, and so that's where some of these names come from. Uh, these communities would later become known as the suburbs or places that were located outside of uh, major metropolitan areas. Here's a picture of what uh, one of the suburbs looked like. You can see how many of the homes were designed the, the same. Um, you know, you can see how the streets are kind of lined out, equal to each other, parallel to each other. Um, but again, these were small communities that we know as suburbs, and you know, obviously we still have suburbs today. So this is beginning of uh, suburbia, as they call it. <clears throat> now the country went from a wartime economy uh, to a peacetime economy, and that can be difficult for a couple of reasons. Uh, many Americans found themselves without jobs uh, at defense industries because since the war was over, a lot of these people were not needed anymore to work, so many of them were laid off and lost their jobs. Um, remember that we also have veterans coming home from war who are also looking for jobs. So we have laid off workers and veterans competing for jobs, so a lot of unemployment at the time. Uh, another thing that was going on was prices were skyrocketing uh, as demand for limited items increased. Things like coffee and sugar that people uh, couldn't buy during the war because they were limited to those resources for rationing purposes. Uh, as people are not able to buy those things, demand uh, uh, is uh, increasing and prices are going to skyrocket. Now, to kind of help alleviate this problem, Congress is going to put in price limits like they did during World War II to help with the rising costs. And this will help uh, alleviate some of those issues. Okay, now to kind of help with the recovery during these economic hardship times, uh, Americans had saved money during the war. Remember, we talked about that during World War II. Since people um, weren't able to buy as much or spend as much, they're able to save their money. With the savings they now have, many were able to afford things like automobiles and houses. So despite early economic struggles, Americans began to bounce back and this post-war boom is going to start. Uh, companies began hiring to keep up with the demand for goods. So since people were demanding more things, uh, companies are going to be able to hire more people. Um, and also with the defense industries that we talked about in the last slide, uh, this growing concern of the expansion of the Soviet Union uh, helped defense, defense industries also hire new people and expand as well. And again, the Marshall Plan, which we talked about in our last unit, uh, in Europe uh, also led to stronger markets overseas so Americans could export more of those goods over there and make more money. Okay, so we're still going to, like I said, the post-war economy is booming, it's starting to grow, but there are still other economic struggles and one happened to be with uh, labor. So despite positive growth, President Truman had to deal with other economic conditions. Uh, like we just said, he had to deal with labor strikes. Uh, these strikes took place in, um, get my mouse here and draw here for you. They took place in uh, steel, coal, and the railroads. <clears throat> 
So those are the three major areas or industries where strikes were taking place. Okay. Uh, now Truman had typically agreed with unions, but he's not going to allow them to uh, shut down the country. So he actually threatened to have them drafted and placed as soldiers uh, required to work by the president. So he's kind of using his military power a little bit to do that. Uh, he also thought of having the government take over the industries. Uh, that way they couldn't shut the, gov uh, the country down. So if the government took over the industries, uh, life could still continue on. Uh, but before he could propose the idea to Congress, the industries, I think, kind of, you know, were a little afraid that what Truman was proposing, uh, and they do end the strike. So Truman was also a strong supporter of civil rights. In 1946, President Truman established a President's Commission on Civil Rights. Now, under the recommendation of the group, Truman asked for certain reforms. He asked for a federal anti-lynching law. He asked for a ban for poll taxes, what poll taxes were, and we'll talk about this in our civil rights unit when we get to it. Uh, poll taxes required African Americans to pay a certain fee to be able to go into the poll to vote. Um, a lot of times many African Americans were unable to pay this poll tax, so they were not able to vote, which is illegal. You cannot stop someone from voting, but um, southern governments in the south at this time were finding ways to prevent African Americans from voting uh, through discrimination. He also urged a creation of a permanent civil rights commission. Now, Congress refused to pass the measures, and they also refused to integrate the armed forces. Um, during World War II, we had black troops, as you remember, we had African American troops and Mexican American troops, uh, but they were separate from white troops. They weren't allowed to serve in the same units or groups or whatever. Um, so Truman had asked Congress to integrate them to allow African Americans and whites to serve in the same military units. Um, so Congress did refuse this. So Truman says he's had enough. He decides to take action himself. In July of 1948, he ordered an executive order that integrated the armed forces and called for an end to discrimination for the federal government. Okay, so people who were hired by the federal government um, wasn't just going to be white people or whatever. It was going to, you know, they had to have, uh, they had to start hiring African Americans as well. And another thing that happened is the Supreme Court also ruled that African Americans could not be banned from living in certain neighborhoods. Okay, so before this, some neighborhoods or developments were forbidding African Americans to purchase homes in those areas. Um, the case went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that was illegal. You cannot stop someone from living where they want to live. All right, so let's talk about the election in 1948. Um, although some Democrats were concerned about Truman's lack of progress in government or uh, just a, a lot of different things um, that were going on, um, they do decide to nominate President Truman for election. Um, Remember that in the southern parts of the country, uh, the southern states, many of them, you know, like we said, were against civil rights. So to protest these recent civil rights measures that President Truman had uh, enacted, southern Democrats formed a state's rights political party known as the Dixiecrats. OK, and they are going to look at a man by the name of uh, J. Strom Thurmond. Uh, he is the governor of South Carolina, so they're going to nominate him to run uh, against President Truman as well. There was also the Progressive Party, which had Henry A. Wallace, who was a former vice president. And the Republicans are going to nominate a man by uh, the name of Thomas E. Dewey, uh, who was the New York governor at the time. So we have four different people running uh, for president in 1948. Now, many did not think Truman could win re-election. But if you look at the electoral map here, you'll see that Truman's in the blue here. Uh, and he did kind of shock the nation. Uh, he did win a good portion of the Midwest and Western parts, which is where Truman was from, a um, good part of the central parts of the United States. And he also did win a lot of the southern states, which many people did not think he'd be able to do, again, due to his um, role in civil rights. Um, you can see Dewey won most of the Northeast and parts of the Midwest. And then we also have Strom Thurmond, who uh, won those southern states for the Dixiecrats. Okay? Um, and that picture there is showing you that many um, newspapers and things like that um, and the press did not believe that Truman could win re-election. So here he is holding up a paper from I believe it's the Chicago Daily Tribune uh, which states that Thomas Dewey had defeated Truman. Uh, so they printed this paper ahead of time before the election results before they came out that day 
Um, and so this is Truman obviously laughing and smiling at this because, again, many people didn't think he was going to be able to win. And the paper actually publicized this, that Dewey defeats Truman. So it was kind of a mistake on their half. So I think the, the media had learned from this a little bit. Uh, but in other cases, they don't. Sometimes they do predict too early the results. But uh, either way, this is one of the most historic pictures in American history of Truman kind of smiling and laughing at this kind of uh, uh, prediction that was wrong. So after his stunning victory, uh, Truman proposed broad economic ideas as an extension to Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal. Remember, Truman was the vice president for Roosevelt. So he comes up with this thing called the Fair Deal. Okay, so this is one of your other vocabularies, the Fair Deal. Uh, and what he called for was a health care insurance compulsory program that was nationwide, so requiring everyone in America to have health insurance. Um, you can probably tie this into the president with, uh, with President Obama um, and Congress had done a couple of years ago with the Affordable Care Act, uh, also known as Obamacare. So this kind of comes to play later on in American history, as you can see, but it was an idea that was floated around uh, prior to President Obama as well. Uh, Truman also looked to support farmers with a crop subsidiary system, uh, but both of, these, both of these measures are going to be defeated uh, in Congress. Okay? Um, a couple of things he was able to do, though, in terms of this fair deal he proposed was uh, he was able to raise the minimum wage, he was able to propose economic relief to cities, uh, extend Social Security, and provide flood and irrigation relief to those parts of the country that needed it. 